All right, welcome everyone. We're going to get on with our next talk. So Thorsten and Greg are joining us here to talk about Databricks cost management, tips and tools to stay under budget. I heard that there's a bounty on their heads put on by the sales team, so thank you for coming. Give them a warm welcome. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us. This is the last session of the Data and AI Summit. I think I'm the, the final spot. They put me in the last one because I'm pretty sure they didn't want to embarrass me. I heard there was the Monopoly man walking around yesterday. Some of you might have seen him. I didn't want anyone to get confused about what this talk was about, so I'm gonna make it very obvious in case anyone walks in late and put on my work clothes. So my name is Greg. I'm the product manager for what we call the money team. I handle the money at Databricks. So our team handles the pipeline that figures out how many DBUs you have used and sends you your bill. And we're also responsible for cost management, which is how you understand the bill. So today we're gonna talk about a few things in cost. Before we dive in though, I wanna make sure everyone's still awake, everyone's functioning, it's been a long week. I want you all to test your audience participation devices. Does everyone have those, everyone ready? You look confused. Let's all raise our right audience participation device. Let's stretch it around, make sure no one pulls a muscle. Left audience participation device, okay, good. It's working, everyone's here, and we're doing well. So let's dive in. Pop quiz, which way do you wanna see your cost chart going? A or B, let's see a show of hands. How many people wanna see their cost chart going up, A? Two hands, how many wanna see it going down? A lot of hands, really? Are you sure about that though? Because one thing I think about is, yeah, maybe the cost of that one project should go down as there's new technology and things get more efficient as we fine tune that workload, but what about that other data set we aren't using yet? There's probably some value hidden in there that we can use and help our company. And then there's that other project we haven't started working yet, but I think that was gonna help the company drive some cost savings or maybe open up a new market. And then that other project, so when I think about all the things we can do with our data and what that cost chart's gonna look like, it goes down and it goes up a little bit. And that's some of what we wanna talk about today. What I believe is that actually you are all okay with your costs going up as long as the value you drive for your companies goes up even faster than that. Show of hands, does that sound about correct? Okay, that sounds about correct, good. We're on the same page. So that's what I'm here at Databricks to do, is to help you understand your costs, get more value for it, and there's a lot we're gonna do. We're gonna cover a few things today uh, on this topic. When I think about the jobs that you need to do to be successful, uh, I think of it in these terms. We're gonna cover a few of these today, including reporting, how you organize and access your data, and then we'll talk a little bit about how you can put some controls in place. So I've been working in the world of billing for a long time, and when I see customers start thinking about money, I tend to see this maturity curve that customers progress through. At some point, they don't worry about costs, then they become aware of it, they start doing something, but maybe a little you know, late after the end of the month, eventually they wanna get more proactive, uh, and that proactivity eventually turns to a place where costs transform how they do their business. I'm really curious for this audience here where you would say you fell. So let's do another show of hands with those audience participation devices. How many of you are unaware that there are costs related to your cloud, to Databricks? Not a single hand. I guess you wouldn't have made it to this talk if you weren't aware that cost was a thing. That's probably. How many of you would say you're aware but you're not doing a single thing about it? Couple brave people. Okay, so you're here at this talk. That's the first thing. You've done one thing. That's a good step. How many of you are reactive? in your costs. You, you do something with costs, but it's maybe after, okay, you know, it's like almost half of the room. How many are proactive? They're doing tagging in place, they're setting budgets and controls, a little less than the last group. And how many of you would say you've completely transformed the way your business works to be cost efficient? You're really setting the standard. Okay, everyone go there for the Q&A afterwards. We had a couple of hands. That's, those are the real experts. We'll bring you up on stage next year. All right, well, my goal for today is that you all learn a few things and can progress a little bit further along this maturity curve. So we're gonna look back at this later and I hope that you've learned a few things that'll take you further. To get started, we wanna make sure everyone understands how the heck Databricks actually bills you for things. So I'm gonna hand it over to my esteemed colleague and one of the few people that makes me feel short, Thorsten, to talk about how Databricks billing works. Thanks, Greg. Um, 
By the way, I, I caught a cold, so my, my voice sounds a bit rough. I, I live in Sweden, so I didn't expect California to be colder than, than Sweden, actually. But yeah. <laughs> okay, let, let's talk about the basics. I think a lot of you probably know about that already, but um, it's good to, to go uh, through it. Um, Databricks uses a flexible pay-as-you-go model, so you basically are charged for what you're using, right? Which means if you are not having any compute running, if you're not using anything inside a workspace, uh, you're not being charged. There are no startup license fees, things like that, and also using features like the data catalog are completely uh, free. <clears throat> um, and then let's talk a bit about the general concepts. So we have the Databricks workspace, which is called the entry point for users, where um, um, users write their code and, and um, do their analysis. And these workspaces come in different pricing tiers, uh, standard, premium, and in the case of AWS, also one called enterprise. So standard is bas basically just a, you can say, hosted Spark. It doesn't come with all the extra features that you usually need for building an enter enterprise application, like security features, governance features, Unity Catalog, all the nice new tools like uh, the warehouses and so on are not in that. So if you're, if you're really like uh, building an enterprise um, application, you want to look at premium for sure. And then the, the enterprise has some extra features, uh, uh, HIPAA compliance and stuff like that. Inside these workspaces, we use uh, compute in form of clusters, warehouses. And for these, uh, for the users, we are charging with so-called Databricks units. So these units are um, basically uh, added or like charged for the workload, and they depend on how large the cluster or the warehouse, uh, basically how powerful it is. Um, if you use photon acceleration, it's something that you can switch on, and that makes it a bit faster. Uh, on the warehouses, Photon is, is uh, on by default. And then the time it takes for, for running the compute. So you basically charge by second exactly how, how long you're, you're running. And this is then um, shown in when you're starting a, a cluster. The, in this example, it will use 10 dBUs uh, per hour. DBUs are then being priced with different price tags. And you can see the overview of on our uh, pricing page. Um, starting from, from jobs, which are like the automated ones, um, all-purpose or interactive clusters, and then we have some, some specific tools like Delta Life Tables, uh, Databricks SQL, et cetera. And how much a DBU costs depends on the type of compute, as I said, like the jobs, is it all-purpose, et cetera. Uh, there are some differences between the cloud providers, between the cloud region, and also then, as mentioned earlier, the, the workspace tier. Uh, one thing I want to mention shortly, which is a bit um, different compared to the cluster is when it comes to model serving. So you heard a lot about LLMs and, and host your own uh, um, uh, model. So what Databricks does is basically you can package your model, um, host it behind an API, and Databricks is, is running it for you in a scalable fashion. And in this case, the pricing is basically um, based on the concurrency. So how many requests per hour can um, this endpoint uh, serve? So that's something that you, you choose beforehand. And then it um, basically depends on, on how many requests that you're getting, how long each of these requests take to, to compute, and that and in the end will then uh, be a DBU number again. So there we land at these DBUs again. And then we have the like, auto-scaling options and even the option to scale to zero, which means if you don't have any requests coming to the endpoint, then you're not uh, um, uh, being charged anything. Now we talked about DBUs, um, but Databricks runs in your compute. And then there's um, things which runs on the, on the individual cloud provider, which is then charged by the cloud provider. These are uh, VMs, like the, the actual compute. VMs come with disks, and they also need networking, like IP addresses, et cetera. Um, data is usually in your own cloud storage on the, the respective cloud provider. Um, and then for each workspace, it also comes with a managed database storage, which is used for storing some uh, internal things, MLflow artifacts, et cetera and which you call um, DBFS. Um, and then you might optionally have additional services like uh, endpoints, firewalls, et cetera. So if we then look at a typical distribution, um, we have the DBUs, like here on the right-hand side, the, the, the graph of the DBUs. We have the, the compute costs and then the storage costs. This is just an example, but, but usually you can say um, it's, it's about in the same order of magnitude, but really depending on what kind of instance types you're using. And one exception here is the serverless compute. So now we're, we're having this new serverless offerings. In that case, you're not paying for any of the uh, VM costs, because VMs are host by data, hosted by Databricks, 
and basically packaged into the DBUs. So in that, that case, you're only paying DBUs and then of course also still the, the storage, uh, et cetera. All right, then now we set the basics. How do you um, manage your costs then? Let's start with understanding what your costs are. And so you wanna do, have some reporting, wanna un understand how much did you spend for, for what. And here, it's also good to, to have a bit of a, like, um, an, um, detailed view for different cloud providers because for each cloud provider it works a bit different. On Azure, um, Databricks is a first party service. We are fully integrated into their billing. You get one bill from Microsoft and then you use Azure's cloud tool, the, the cost management tool for analyzing your costs. On AWS, um, on the infrastructure side, um, AWS is billing you. But on, on the DBU side, there are two methods. Either you're paying right away to Databricks by credit card um, or you're basically integrating Databricks into the AWS market space. And in that case, um, you will see one total DBU sum that you have been used. You, so if you want to break that down, you have different uh, methods for cost analysis. So on the, on the DBU side, and I'm going to talk about these in a moment, we have an account console, which is basically displaying um, some logs, like billable usage logs that we are creating um, and that you can then uh, use for breakdown. And then for the infrastructure, you use the AWS Cost Explorer and, and uh, Tax. And GCP is basically the same as for, for AWS. The only difference there is that um, what I said earlier about no cost if nothing is running is a bit different on GCP. There, the VMs are being hosted on, on Google Kubernetes um, engine, and then you have a fixed monthly cost per workspace between seven and $200, depending on how much you're using this workspace. So that's a little overview for, for the different uh, tools. And then I mentioned the account console. That's what it's looked like. So if you log in to, to the website below, then you will come to your account. If you're an admin, you will be seeing this. Uh, if, you, if you're just a usual user, you, would, you don't have access to this view. And here you can then break down um, the DBUs over time, DBU costs per workspace, per SKU. So SKU means the type of compute. Was it a C um, um, SQL warehouse? Was it a job cluster, et cetera? And, and then if you scroll down, you can also then see um, um, for each workspace exactly what you have been, been using. Another example here, this would then be for the Azure cost management tool. As mentioned on Azure, it works a bit different. And um, that's, that's what you would use for, for DBU cost, but also for infrastructure cost. You're using different filters to see um, like the part that you are interested in. So on the right-hand side there, is basically it, it shows a bit the different resources, how they're grouped in, in, in resource groups. You can filter for one resource group, then you can see the total amount of costs for that one. You, you can split it per SKU, et cetera. So, and that is nothing different and then for any other Azure tool as well. So you're basically using the same methods there. All right, so I gave a bit of an overview. How do you um, access cost data? So I talked about uh, using cloud providers um, tools, uh, the billable usage logs that we are creating, which you then analyze in the account console. And then there's one that I didn't mention, which is called Overwatch. So we have this Databricks Labs project, and if you go to this website, um, there, there are a number of projects. This is an example which uses these logs and uses, uses other, other information to display uh, the total cost. So you could um, check that out as well. However, now there's something new coming, and I'm gonna hand over to Greg again. How many of you are using one of the existing methods today to understand something about your cost? How many of you are completely satisfied with what you're using today? There's not a hand up. Okay, so some of what we're doing is investing in a future to make it easier for you to do those jobs we showed earlier. And one of the things at the core of this is system tables. So Matei announced this at the keynote as part of Lakehouse Observability. And what I wanna do is show you the billing part of system tables and how you can use that to solve some of the challenges that I believe you're having. So first of all, Billing system tables are available now in public preview. That QR code takes you to the documentation to opt in and set it up. Earlier I was working at the Databricks booth. I got a demo machine set up, running, and I got my first couple queries live in under 10 minutes. So you can do this very quickly, start running some of the queries we're showing today. So public preview for AWS and Azure now, and we'll talk about some more of what's coming soon. So what are system tables? Well, system tables is a foundation of a tool set that we believe is gonna help you solve these jobs. It's a data set, it's a live table that's in your meta store that gives you access 
with very low latency to all of your billing data so you can run queries. A lot of these things you could do today, but it requires you to take down a billing CSV and upload it through some ETL job to analyze it further. Now with system tables, the table is there, you can write a query, you can have a dashboard, and I'm gonna show you some of that. So you can certainly get this data and pass it to an external source. If you're using a third-party cost management app to understand all of your cloud costs, the data can go there. If you have any sort of visualization BI tool, you can access uh, the system tables data there, so you can make charts, you can analyze it, and you can pass it through to your cloud provider. It's also very easy to use Databricks features to analyze this, and I'm gonna show you a few of those. And in the future, we're gonna continue investing in the customization of these Databricks tools to make it easier and easier to understand, understand your costs in the Databricks cost center. So the first table that's live is our billing usage table. Here's the schema for it, it's on the documentation. What I thought we'd do at this point of the presentation is all stare at the schema and write SQL in our head and imagine all the cool things we can do for about five minutes quietly, and then we would progress. It's, no one seems excited about that idea. Maybe, should I do a demo instead? Okay, let's do a demo. All right, so there's a lot of cool stuff you can do with system tables. I have some screenshots here of various dashboards you can make using them, but why don't I show you some of what you can actually do? So first of all, where does this live? Well, I've set up system tables to be a part of my meta store. For at least this workspace, I have Unity Catalog turned on. You don't need to use Unity Catalog across your entire organization, but the meta store is part of Unity Catalog, so at least for the analysis workspace. Then you can see I have system, billing, and my usage table. The first three tables that are live on system tables are our access table for auditing, our lineage table for you to see where the data is flowing, and then the billing table. More tables will be coming in the future, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So what can you do? Well, let's start off by looking at a cost chart. Over time, how many DBUs we've been consuming. So we have a nice SQL query that's selecting from system billing usage, and there's our chart. Wow, it looks like things are going up, like that slide I showed earlier. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I forget which direction. Let's dive in a little further. So how many DBUs from each SKU are being used? Okay, it looks like a lot of it over here is on this product, serverless, jobs. We have some different things. You know, this is helpful, but it doesn't really tell me which of these products is growing or shrinking the fastest. Why don't I do a comparison and look at last month prior to the month, or to the month prior, compare them and see which SKUs are growing. So here I have another simple SQL query. By the way, all these queries are available in the documentation. You can copy and paste the SQL and run it on your own organization. Quickly have this chart, and your SQL might be better than ours, and so maybe you can make it a little faster. You can slice and dice it the way you want. So here's a comparison looking at each SKU in the month of May and the month of June to see how they compare. And I can see, wow, some SKUs we're using a lot less of. Standard all-purpose compute has gone way down. But standard all-purpose compute with Photon has gone way up. I bet that workload's running a lot faster now than it used to be now that it's using Photon. Um, so now I can slice down a little more and say, okay, maybe I should pay attention to these three SKUs that are doubling month over month and see what's going on. Why don't I look at one in particular? So here's the all-purpose compute Photon SKU I just mentioned, and here's the trend we have for it. So now I've sliced into a single SKU. Again, I've run a report, and I can see, wow, we're using about five times as much of this SKU as we were just a few months ago. This is probably worth looking into for me to understand why is this scaling so fast. Maybe I should talk to the team that's using it and understand can I help them uh, optimize it, can I make sure they're doing the right thing? If it's gonna be growing this fast, maybe it's a good thing or maybe it's an area that we can use some fine tuning. So one of the next things I'm gonna do is figure out who owns this. I'll look at what cluster that SKU's being used on. Bing, 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 I found the right one. So that team is using it. And I happen to know that this cluster is a fairly large cluster. And then if I look at the permissions, I can see who the owner is. So I'm an admin in this case. And I can send an email to that person and set up a meeting and say, hey, what are you using that for? What are your plans for the future? So that's an example of something we can do to understand a growing area of costs, take action on it in an organization where there might be a team that's growing quickly and maybe doesn't know all the optimization techniques they can take. 
Another really common job I hear about folks needing to do is do attribution at the end of the month. You know, some of you might have been in the scenario where you were using Databricks and you were the only Databricks user in your company at one point. But now, you know, maybe there's a lot of teams across the company that are logging in. And maybe your company has either a chargeback or a showback model, where at the end of the month you need to show who's responsible for what costs. That's easy to do. We'll show you some of how you can use our tagging to organize your costs. And once you do that, you can run cost attribution using the custom tags. In this case, we use an owner field in this environment. And I can send back a report of all the costs to the individuals at the end of the month, whether I do chargeback, showback, something like that to the different business units, cost centers, et cetera. So these are a few of the things you can do with system tables. This is all live now. One other thing I often hear people say is, hey, I want a dashboard. My boss wants to see some charts and look at them. I have another example of a dashboard, a real pretty one with some trend lines, with spending. This one is also available for you to download and set up for your organization or further tweak as you might need to. Now you're logging in, you're looking at this dashboard, but we all know that your boss isn't actually logging in and looking at a dashboard. So you can do this nice thing, which is set auto refresh, and then you can come in here, um, download a PDF of it, and you can email them that PDF of the charts if you need to, or you can set up a job to do that automatically. So these are some of the things I hear about customers needing to do with costs. These are some of the things that are now easier with system tables. I'd love to hear how you're using it if you sign up and start doing it. So let's connect. So we've had a number of customers that are using, and I just wanted to share some success stories. It's always great to put the customer first when we're talking about these. One of our customers, Rec Room, was able to find a zombie job that slipped its way from a development environment to production that wasn't of much use. By identifying it and removing it, they're saving five digits annually on their Databricks deployment, which they were very excited about. So they were a part of our private preview of the system tables feature. Another company has a very rigorous chargeback model, and they had been trying for years to set that up using some of the prior methods we showed on the earlier slide. They started using system tables, and they were able to do it uh, much faster. You know, finally, they were able to complete that job. So we've had a lot of good success with this product, and we're excited for the rest of you to be able to use it. We're also not done building. So what's coming next? Well, we're in public preview now, which means anyone can opt in. I know some companies don't let you use public preview. You want to be to GA. GA also means it's going to have sort of our full guarantees around that. That's one of the things coming soon. We'll also be launching some new tables. One of them is a price table. So you can have all the list prices available as a table to multiply by DBUs if you want to see things in dollar terms. That will also include any discounts if you have a commitment and negotiated pricing with Databricks. So you can either do it at list price or at discounting price, depending on the permissions and visibility within your company. And then um, a cost table, which shows more about how the costs match your invoice, shows any credits that are being used, et cetera. So cost is slightly different than usage in those terms. System tables is also coming for GCP. Do I have any GCP customers in the house, Google Cloud? A few, so I, I love uh, Google. I worked for Google for four years, and so I wanted to share one win with you as well. We recently launched the API access to the cost CSV on Google, so for those of you that are waiting for system tables, for the next couple months, you can use that API to get that and automatically put it in cloud storage and process the same data. It's a little more work, but we'll make it easier very soon with system tables that's coming. There's also additional tables that some of my peers in product management are working on for you to join with and have more detail. So I've been talking to the jobs team, clusters, DLT, and DBSQL. One of the things you'll be able to do, for example, is use the DBSQL query history tool to by query do attribution of cost by seeing which queries were running on a warehouse. You have the cost of a warehouse. You can attribute, hey, you were taking up 50% of that warehouse. Now, if you have one you know, warehouse but multiple teams using it, you can do that per query chargeback using that table. So that's something that's coming soon and something I've heard a lot of people ask for. So that's system tables. I hope you're able to use it and you enjoy. One more thing that you can do on top of system tables is put some controls in place. So I want to talk about the topic of control, and we'll go through this a bit quickly because we are uh, a little behind on time. One thing I hear about from customers is I want to control our spend. I don't want spend just running away. There's three primary ways we recommend to control spend so you don't wake up to a ping one morning. 
uh, that you know, a bill was way over what you expected. The first is cluster policies. This is obvious to some of you, but if you're not using them yet, cluster policies allows you to find limits to say, hey, this person or this role can only uh, spin up clusters of this size, put some limits in place, which will limit the amount of spend. The second thing we recommend is sharing usage with the actual users so they can understand what the costs are of the things they're doing. So previously that might have been difficult with system tables, you can now create a view, perhaps slice down to the workspace level for that user and share with them that dashboard like I just showed you so they can log in. We're also working on making this easier and easier to get into the product, so if you have needs around that, I'd love to hear them. And finally, you can set up budgets and alerts. So DB SQL tool, Databricks' SQL product, has an alerts functionality where you can define by query uh, an alert that will fire. I have a demo of it, but we're a little short on time, so I'll share this out um, and you can watch it later. But essentially what you're going to do is write the SQL query on that system table to define a budget in terms of DBUs, set up that Databricks SQL alert, you can schedule it to run every hour, every day, whatever frequency you'd like, and then connect it with one of the various endpoints. It can be an email, you can connect with Slack, with Teams, or you can use a generic webhook to take action on it. So this is an easy way, now that you have system tables, you can set up budgets and alerts for various things, so you can be notified more quickly if they go over. I'm gonna hand it back to Thorsten to talk about how to organize your data. Thanks. Um, yeah, so, so one thing to consider when setting up your, infra or like your, your organization, your workspaces, is also from the uh, cost perspective. Um, I wanted to give a bit of an overview of the hierarchy for, for different um, cloud providers, and basically what you are seeing when you're looking at the uh, account level and when you're looking at the cost that you're seeing there. So for example, for on Azure, you would see the total spend on the tenant, um, but then you can um, uh, limit um, basically users or, or teams into a specific workspaces and then analyze these, uh, the cost per workspace and having the break, breakdown there. However, if you want to have a bit more fine-grained um, um, breakdown, you can use uh, tagging. So tags are basically key value pairs, and um, there are default um, tags on, um, on Databricks instances, and then you can also add your custom ones. Um, and these tags are inherited by all the resources underlying that are, that are being used. So on the highest level, we have the workspace. However, that only exists in Azure because in Azure, we have the, the resource of a workspace. That concept doesn't exist on the other clouds. Uh, and then we have the, the cluster. And if you have a like, set a tag to a cluster, the VM and the disk, et cetera, that is being used by that cluster are inheriting uh, these tags. And then in the end, um, they're, they are being propagated to the usage logs for DBUs or to the cloud provider tools. And there you can then analyze costs per tag. So if you make sure that a specific user a specific team always uses this, the same um, uh, tag for their workspaces in the end of the, of the month or year, you can then basically break down uh, the exact costs um, for, for this uh, instance. And then you can use these tags or um, workspaces to create like a chargeback scenario. So as a, as a first step, you would manage um, your teams or your project and make sure that they only use specific workspaces or they only use specific tags. And then you can go ahead and break down the cost for these workspaces or tags and then create a process um, like, like we showed earlier to deliver a report to the respective uh, teams or this respective unit to know what, what uh, um, the spend was. And the same concept can also be used, for example, for return of investment calculations when you want to know uh, how much did I spend on this uh, uh, project um, how much did I get back? So that would be the first step um, for this calculation. Now, let's talk about a bit about how we then uh, optimize our costs. And so the basic concept is, is that if you have an optimized platform, um, you need less compute, you need a shorter processing times, and therefore a reduced cost because the compute is what you're paying for, right? What you want to do is you want to start with a good foundation on the data side, on the file layout, um, and from there, make sure that your code is optimized that you use to run uh, on your data. And then in the end, once th these are set up, you can look at um, fine-tuning the, the cluster sizing or the type of cluster that you're using for it. And for each of these points, um, if I go back, 
I mean, I could ha have a whole presentation just about that. So what I want to do here is really just highlight some of the key uh, high-level points. We had a lot of other sessions around optimization that you, that you can check out at the summit. Um, but just out of experience, a bit of what, what I've seen in the field uh, and what, what can help. So the first step would be using a Delta format. If you don't do it yet, I really recommend it, not only because it's, it's a compressed format with Paki under the hood, but also it really adds uh, a lot of, to the performance. And then once you use Delta, you want to use Delta best practices. So if you go to our docs, um, there's something called Delta, Delta best practices talking about um, how you basically un optimize the underlying uh, file format. Uh, one is that you, that you compact uh, a lot of smaller files to larger chunks. That makes it much um, more performant to, to read these files. You want to use some sort of indexing like Z-ordering to basically tell um, um, Databricks or tell Spark where to look for specific data and where, what parts to skip. That makes access much faster. Um, and then there are now a number of things coming um, where we want to take this away from the user to exactly know what to do and basically have more of a managed approach from, from the data side. And, and one of these is, for example, that if you use Unity Catalog Managed Tables, um, where Databricks is, is managing the underlying uh, data, then there is some automatic uh, file size tuning that Databricks is doing. In addition to that, we also have auto-optimize, um, auto-compaction, but these are all on the, by default. So we're going towards more uh, letting Databricks do the job for you. Another thing that one can see is that when you have large, um, large files or large tables and there are changes in them, that often um, people tend to rerun um, or like run through the whole table. Uh, instead of using, for example, a CDT, CDC, a change data capture architecture, you can do that with Delta Life tables, where you really just look at um, the change that has been done on the previous table um, and ingest that change or, or, or just these changes into the um, new table to avoid reprocessing of, of large amounts of data. Another thing you want to do is using a vacuum command. So Delta keeps a uh, history of changes being done. And um, if you do a lot of changes to a table, this can get a large amount of uh, data. So what you want to do is when you run the vacuum, there's a de defined uh, time span, and everything older than that will be uh, deleted. And therefore, you don't have these really large uh, files in your storage. All right, on the code side, um, if you use the latest d uh, DBR, like the, the, the latest uh, database runtime, then usually you get better performance. There are all these new announcements, new, new things coming into runtime. We understand that usually that also means um, you want to test for it or, or, or you want to make sure it's, it's running, so there are maybe some processes you need there. But just to keep in mind, latest runtime usually means better performance. And then also what I see a lot is that people who come from, from Python, who come from um, object-oriented uh, programming, use similar concepts that they learned before in Spark and do things that, that Spark can't parallelize well. Um, and then some of the tips are, for example, avoid using loops if possible, um, avoid using like, non-vectorized user-defined functions because then the Spark optimizer, for, for the optimizer is just a black box that can't uh, um, optimize that for best performance, and instead use like, built-in functions and like, like, this functional programming uh, par paradigm. Um, one, another thing is uh, be aware of Spark's lazy evaluation. So the way how you address data frames uh, in the background, um, Spark is creating like, like a um, um, run plan. It works a bit different than addressing variables in Python, for example. So you don't want to readdress the same uh, data frame over and over again because it will just rerun the, this, um, uh, the optimization plan. Um, and then also, you can fine tune a lot with configurations, uh, a lot with uh, Spark configurations, and maybe get a little bit um, better performance if you if you uh, um, tune one of these configs. But on the long run, in a new runtime, maybe we, we optimize that, we automated that. Um, so you want to make sure that you're not keeping these these specific configurations for one use case, um, and and look over them and and um, maybe clean them out if needed. And one way to, to simplify is if you simply use a declarative language like SQL, so in that sense, really, um, you just say what you want to do and let the optimizer in the background uh, decide how to do it. And that's also then being used, for example, for Delta Live tables, um, where it's really, really being run in the best fashion on the infrastructure. And then on the compute side, um, select the optimal compute for the workload. 
one of the easiest tricks is really to use job clusters for automated jobs. And it's something that, that I also see a lot, um, that people run automated scheduled jobs on all-purpose compute. And job clusters are cheaper. They come with a lower price tag. So if you just use job clusters, um, you can instantly save, save some money there. Use SQL warehouses um, for SQL workloads might sound obvious, but also um, I, I see a lot that that is not being done, and they're much more performant. They're optimized for these kind of workloads. And then if you use pure Python, especially in machine learning, et cetera, when you don't have code that parallelizes on a, on a cluster, you don't need a cluster. You just need a single node, and that is, uh, you can uh, also easily um, pick in, in Databricks. You want to mi minimize the idle time, because if a cluster is up and running, um, even if it doesn't do anything, you're still paying for it. So for that, you can use auto termination, auto scaling, and these can also be like the auto termination can be a factor um, um, that that you like have on by, by default for, for users using these cluster policies, for example. Um, and then another way is using serverless. So with serverless, you have your compute up instantly, and you shut it down after you you don't need it anymore, and it also has a much faster auto scaling. Um, serverless now is available for, for SQL and um, coming now in preview for, for DLT and for um, workflows, but it's on the long run, it's going to be an option for all types of compute inside Databricks. Um, and then if you want to save on the VM costs, you can um, select spot instances or for AWS fleet instance types, which basically are a cheaper way of, com of, of uh, compute. They might uh, fail, so uh, this workload might then uh, take a bit longer because it has to fi find a new VM that is available, but that's one way to really um, uh, minimize these VM costs. And then finally, one thing I, I see a lot is that people who try to save costs, they choose a very small cluster on their job because they think smaller cluster means less uh, money, but often, it, it, this is um, counterintuitive, but uh, if, you use a, if you run a job, you just pay for the time that the job is running, right? So if you have a more powerful compute option, then this job will, will um, compute in a much shorter time, and therefore you're being charged for this shorter time. So the ways of giving your, your compute more power is by basically using a larger cluster, by enabling Photon, or using a disk cache. Um, and then, um, in, in this example, also what to consider, you maybe have a higher price take on the DBUs, but if you run like in just in half of the time, um, you are also saving on the infrastructure costs of the underlying infrastructure, and therefore the total costs um, might be lower. So, yeah, consider that when, when selecting um, your your compute. Okay, all right. As a summary, um, first of all, of course, pick the right, right foundation. If you're here, you're you're already um, um, using Databricks, I assume. So it's a system that makes the architecture. Uh, like simplifies the architecture, avoids lock-in, so that in the in the future the price tag can be can be increased and you can't get out of it. Um, you want to optimize your platform. You want to use some reporting to understand your costs. Where do you spend uh, your money on? You want to set up uh, control for your spends, like cluster policies, like alerts. And then one thing I didn't touch yet is that. If you forecast your spend, if you know you're going to spend this much in a year, you can also get discounts on DBUs by uh, having a commit, like a pre-purchase of these DBUs. Um, and that's something we can help you with at Databricks. So if you cont contact your Databricks representative, we can help you with a forecast, but also what kind of discounts you can, you can get there. So we said earlier that we hoped you would learn something today. Let's see a show of hands. Did anyone learn something new about cost, a new tool available to them, something they can go home? All right, it looks like we've achieved our goal. So uh, we're going to open the floor up for questions. We have a few minutes until we're officially over, but since we're the last session here, I don't think they're actually going to kick us out, so I'm willing to stay around a bit. And for any brave uh, attendees that want to ask a question, since this is the money talk, we've got some golden nuggets for you in the form of chocolate. So. We, have, we have a question over there. Thank you. 